I want you all to think back to the most awkward time of your life, your middle school years. <laughs> think back. Are you there? Now, go into your room and look around. What superheroes do you see on your wall? Do you see Nelson Mandela? Do you see Ava Medar? Or do you see Shimon Perez? No? All right. Now, fast forward a few years. Now, you aren't quite as awkward, but equally confused, solidly in your teenage years in high school. Go back into your room. This time, look in your closet. Who inspired your shoe game? Who inspired your sense of fashion? When you sat on your bed and imagined your life in the future, who inspired your daydreams? Was it Desmond Tutu? Was it the Dalai Lama? Or was it Jody Williams? None of these people? Let's try this one more time. Now think back to your college days. For some of you, that is right now. What organizations sparked your interest? Was it the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War? Was it the international campaign to ban landmines? Or was it the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons? None of this? Why are these types of people or organizations often in the fringes of our personal and social cognizance? Why? You see, when we care about something, we tend to celebrate it and place value on it. For example, we celebrate and value entertainers from sports to film, from music to television, because we care about entertainment and we have zealously mainstreamed entertainment culture. But I imagine we also care about peace, about tolerance, about social and economic justice for all. However, if we compare the mainstream levels of peace culture to entertainment culture, we will see a significant disparity in our efforts and commitment. There is a shortage of the kind of centralization, the kind of cultivation, the kind of celebration of proactive peace structures that we need to build stronger and more peaceful communities. If we care about peace as we say we do, then we must be willing to move peace from the sidelines of our personal and social cognizance into the mainstream of our communal consciousness. In the next 12 minutes, I will attempt to make the case for why and how we can begin to propagate peace culture into mainstream culture. That way, we can begin to see the Dalai Lama, for example, in the same light we see, say, Peyton Manning. Exciting, talented, and just plain cool. <laughs> so we know that economic stability and peace are intimately intertwined. If you lose one, you are likely to lose the other. There is growing body of evidence that the presence of proactive peace structures and systems are necessary preconditions for investment, for trade, for sustained economic growth, and for prosperity. The United States Peace Index, which examines violent crimes, homicides, policing, and small arms show that more peaceful states tend to have more economic opportunities, better provision of basic human services, and higher levels of educational attainment. Additionally, social capital is correlated with more peaceful states, which also tend to have higher levels of volunteerism and public trust. These variables are components of peace culture. Therefore, the continuous absence of proactive peace culture in our communities or peace structures in our communities can only undermine our efforts to grow peace culture. We also know that peace is not the absence of conflict, but the ability to handle conflict in peaceful ways. The correlation and causal relationships between peace culture and peace processes and social and economic development are apparent. You see, under a culture of peace, people are inherently drawn to nonviolence pursue collaboration over competition, work to reduce conflicts, and manage relationships. 
under a culture of peace, the terms peace activist, peace advocate, peacekeeper, peace builder, peacemaker are respectable and desired identities. Under a culture of peace, people work to build systems and structures that promote justice and fairness. And under a culture of peace, conflict resolution and peace building are core parts of our education systems, core parts of our business practices and models, core parts of our social and economic systems. So, how can we actively cultivate peace culture across our communities? The tenant of the tipping point theory by author and journalist Malcolm Gladwell can be applied in our efforts to grow peace culture into mainstream culture. The tipping point theory examines the processes by which things become popular or mainstream. You see, Gladwell presents three key factors that each play a role in determining whether or not a particular trend will tip into wide-scale popularity. The law of the few, the stickiness factor, and the power of context. And these tenants are relevant to peace seekers because ultimately we want peace culture to tip into exponential success. But first, the law of the few. This principle contends that before wide scale popularity can be attained, a few key types of people must champion an idea, product, or concept before there is a tipping point. In regard to peace theory, these key types would be our teachers, our community leaders, our religious leaders, our company CEOs, our public officials, and they all have to champion peace and peace culture as part of their agenda. Gladwell describes these key types as mavens, connectors, and salesmen. If we are willing to tip peace culture into wide-scale popularity, we have to become salesmen of peace, each and every one of us, in whatever capacity we occupy. If we actively endorse peace culture, it is more likely that it will tip into wide-scale popularity. The second criteria is the stickiness factor. According to Gladwell, this is the quality that compels people to pay close, sustained attention to a product, a concept, or an idea. To get peace culture to stick, to make peace culture appealing, we must begin to celebrate and recognize peace agents and peace activists and peacekeepers and peacemakers who are making extraordinary contributions in our community, from police officers to community organizers. We must begin to celebrate their stories and effort. Winners of Peace Awards should begin to grace our billboards and our TV screens and our magazine covers and our cereal boxes because what we see is what we become. What we value is what we desire. And what we celebrate is what we try to emulate. If organizations and companies and schools and institutions begin to recognize peace agents, whether through grants, scholarships, tax breaks, endorsements, and other grand ways, we are more likely to grow and sustain peace culture. And third is the power of context. This infers that ideas, concepts, and products like epidemics are sensitive to the conditions and circumstances of the times and places in which they occur. To build or cultivate an environment that allows peace culture to thrive, we have to invite every sector, every member of the culture machine to endorse and sponsor an effort toward peace building. That means we get our schools, our organizations, and our institutions to integrate a peace building dynamic to their brand, their uh, business models, and their marketing campaigns. Additionally, a culture of peace will thrive if we invest in centers for peace and conflict resolution, where people separated by values, beliefs, and interests can share a simple moment of interaction, a place that connects people who are otherwise not exposed to each other on a daily basis. So, how can we build a culture of peace? How can we foster cultural diplomacy? How can we cultivate or propagate peace culture into mainstream culture? We can begin by taking the following steps. One, embrace the peace agent identity. Embrace the peace agent identity and become a champion for peace and conflict resolution in your community. Raise peace building issues. Hold peace conferences and dialogues to reconcile adversaries and differences. Two, 
Let's recognize and celebrate peace agents in our community, whether they are intervening in a bullying incident in their fifth grade class, whether they are helping to deflect teens from drugs, gangs, and violence, or whether they are helping restore civility and peace in war-torn countries abroad. And third, let us support peace education programs and curriculums from K through 12 and upward to proceed peace as a pivotal part of our intellectual culture. And let's invest in centers for peace and conflict resolution in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, so that we can empower people to partake in peace processes. When we are asked, what can we do to expand people's capacity to pursue peace, to transcend horrid experiences, to heal, to reconcile, to forgive, and to coexist? Part of the answer is we have to build a culture of peace that empowers people to be peacemakers as well as peacekeepers. If we care about peace as we say we do, then we must be willing to move peace from the sidelines of our personal and social cognizance into the mainstream of our communal consciousness. This way peace is visible. This way peace is a part of our function. This way peace is a part of our personal and social identity. Now when you go back to your community and look around, what would you like to see? Unfortunately, you will see division. You will see antagonism. You will see violence and even apathy. But if we embrace the peace agent identity, identity, if we invest in centers for peace and conflict resolution, if we support and promote peace agents and peace organizations, we are most like, more likely to change all of this. What we see is what we become. What we value is what we desire, and what we celebrate is what we try to emulate. Thank you. Mm -hmm.